Dean Hagelin is an actor, a comedian, and an inventor who is probably best known for his recurring role on The X-Files. We'll talk with Dean about UFOs and his recent documentary, The Truth Is Out There. Maureen and I will also discuss real-life X-Files, recently released by the UK. We'll talk about an interesting UFO crash in Russia, as well as other space and UFO news right now on Spacing Out. everyone and welcome to Spacing Out. I'm Jason McClellan. And I'm Maureen Ellsbury. Thanks for joining us. We're excited to have Dean Hagelin on today's episode. Many of you probably remember Dean from his role on the X-Files as one of the lone gunmen. You know, the conspiracy theory guy, computer hacker, geeky guy with the glasses and long blonde hair. Well, that's Dean. <laughs> we'll talk with Dean or the geek guy about his recent documentary, The Truth Is Out There. But first, let's talk about UFOs in the news. <laughs> Russian radio station The Voice of Russia reports that plans are underway to utilize UFO tourism to draw visitors to the Leningrad region of the country. A new tourist route will take visitors through the Vespian Forest and will visit the site of a 1961 UFO incident where a massive cylindrical object fell into Lake Corbuzero, or Corb Lake for short. This UFO incident reportedly occurred on the night of April 27, 1961. Divers explored the lake and although they did not find the cylindrical object that fell from the sky, they did discover evidence indicating that the object impacted with the lake's floor and then advanced approximately 65 feet after impact. Researchers indicated that the UFO broke through ice when it entered the lake, suggesting the lake was frozen over at the time of the incident. Mikhail Gerstein, chairman of the Ufologist Commission of the Russian Geographic Society, told The Voice of Russia, the ice pieces which were knocked out by that body were floating in an ice hole and had an intensively green color. The researchers took ice samples but failed to find the cause of such strange coloring. Gerstein also says samples from the lake's floor were also collected and tested, but nothing unusual was detected. But Gerstein explains that the strangest discovery during investigation of this case was mysterious balls, which were so light that they could float on the water surface. They had a very complicated chemical structure, and after their analysis, an assumption was made that they were formed during high temperature process, a kind of welding. Researchers have also noted unusual extents of plant growth where the lake's floor where the object crashed. Despite the conducted investigations and the collected evidence, the identity of what crashed into Corb Lake in 1961 remains an enigma. The mystery surrounding this case is what officials are hoping will appeal to tourists drawing visitors to the region. This is a really interesting case uh, because, again, I, I feel like there's a lot of Russian cases that always have this uh, scientific evidence that they test and you get these weird chemical compounds, but these balls apparently that were floating on the surface uh, had sort of a metallic color and there was gray foam supposedly surrounding them and when they were tempered with they were changing color without changing their shape which is very interesting. This is a great case and I'm I was shocked when I when I heard about it because I hadn't heard this case before and it's from 1961. Yeah. Um, lots of interesting evidence here and um, I asked our colleague Antonio Huneas to look more into this and he has a vast collection of files from over the years. He's been right. researching um, since before I was born. And uh, he actually found some of the original uh, reports from the, the people who investigated this case. And we posted those on our website at openminds.tv. So look at those. And we'll talk with Antonio on a future episode of Spacing Out so he can tell us more about this case as well as some other interesting UFO cases from Russia. Yeah, excellent. A man walking along the seafront in the popular northeast Malta tourist town of Aura photographed a UFO. The 29-year-old witness who was visiting from Romania saw the UFO hovering over the sea on Thursday, July 12th at approximately 8 p.m. He explains, I was out walking when all of a sudden I saw something appear in the sky. It disappeared in a matter of a few seconds. He managed to quickly photograph the object with his cell phone camera, but was unable to determine the identity of the object. The witness described the UFO as a dark, triangle-shaped object that moved at a high rate of speed. The Times of Malta reported that an elaborate military exercise with a helicopter by the armed forces of Malta took place on the same area in, on the same day, but the exercise took place two hours after the sighting. No reports of unusual aerial objects were received in the Malta Air Traffic Services told Times of Malta. From an air traffic management perspective, all aircraft flying at that hour were accounted for. The witness's photo of the object is blurry and provides little detail. 
Judging by the photo alone, to me, the object resembles a seagull in flight. Mm -hmm. And we see a lot of these photos of weird objects over the sea. It's completely blurry and does resemble a seagull in flight. But if we listen to the witness's testimony in this case, if that testimony is accurate, and he did observe the object hovering like he described and then watched it take off, that really doesn't fit with the bird idea. Right, and this is really difficult because this is one of the situations where we have to rely on the witness testimony and assume that he's not lying. But, I mean, it so clearly resembles <laughs> seagull in flight. And I'm trying to even see triangle object, but I don't if see, it does, see a triangle I don't at all. really, yeah. And, and somebody who spoke to Times of Malta, um, a UFO investigator, mentioned that the object looks like the, the uh, typical saucer-shaped object. And I forget the quote, it was something funny. I'm like, this is a, a dream catch or something. But I mean, we, we see this with other seagull photos too, where people mm -hmm. think they, they see a saucer shape. And you look at it and you see this kind of like bump at the top. But if you look air. at it, it's not <laughs> that, that that bump in the top, like a typical right. flying saucer, um, isn't exactly in the center. You see it to one side or the other, and that's exactly what you see when, uh, you know, when a seagull is flying. You see the head kind of up and the tail extending back. So not exactly a saucer. In my opinion, that's just my opinion, but it is a blurry photo. You can't tell much. But going off the witness's testimony, it's an interesting case. Yeah, so you can check out the photo on our Facebook, uh, Open Minds Magazine, and judge for yourself. UK's National Archives published 6,785 pages on Thursday, July 12th from the Ministry of Defense documents related to UFOs and extraterrestrials. The latest release is the ninth batch of UFO files released by the archives since 2008. Former MOD official UFO investigator Nick Pope told The Telegraph that this latest batch of released files is absolutely fascinating and it contains a huge mixture of material that will be of great interest to anyone fascinated with UFOs. 25 files make up these 6,785 pages, and the National Archives explains topics include UFO policy, parliamentary questions, media issues, public correspondence, and UFO sighting reports. The files include many interesting UFO sightings submitted to the MOD, some by pilots, police, and military officials. In case you don't have the time or desire to read through 6,785 pages of documents, here are five highlights from the latest release. The latest release of files includes information about the Ministry of Defense UFO desk. Although many media outlets are reacting like this is the first mention of this post within the MOD, the UFO desk has been public knowledge for quite some time. Nick Pope, who is quoted in nearly every article related to UFOs in the UK, ran the MOD's UFO desk from 91 to 94. However, recently released information related to the UFO desk is mildly interesting. Documents detail the duties of the UFO desk officer and the actual internal job posting for the position is in the files as well. One document contains a 1995 briefing by a UFO desk officer who cited the need for a, quote, full study of UFO data as national security implications have never been properly assessed. The officer states in the briefing, the national security implications are considerable. We have many reports of strange objects in the, in the sky. We have never investigated them. In that same briefing document, the UFO desk officer suggests capturing UFO technology for UK use. The officer states, if reports are taken at face value, then devices exist that do not use conventional reaction propulsion systems. They have a very wide range of speeds and are stealthy. I suggest that we could use this technology if it exists. The files contain a copy of a 1996 parliamentary question from Martin Redmond, MP, asking if MI6 and GCHQ monitors UFO investigations or keeps tabs on ufologists. The National Archives summarizes the response contained in the files, explaining that the background briefing says, neither agency, in fact, undertakes such activity, though GCHQ cannot rule out the possibility they had monitored, in other contexts, individuals who had made a study of UFOs. And one document making considerable headlines shows that the former British Prime Minister, Tony Blair, was briefed on UFO documents. As the Metro explains, the MOD documents show the former Labour leader was apparently concerned about information on the unidentified objects being released to the public. As a result of impending Freedom of Information Act, so decided to find out what facts existed. This came after author and researcher Nick Redfern urged him to consider making available for public scrutiny all of the many and varied UFO reports compiled by the government. The recently released files are currently available at the National Archives website, and if you haven't been through this process before where they've released batches of files, they do have them on the National Archives website for a month 
free available to the public for downloads. You can go and download all of those PDF files and have those for your records. And then after the month, they're not gone, but they're gone for free. You, you can access them if you want to pay money. So if you're interested at all in these files, go quick. Go quickly, <laughs> download them for free. Otherwise, you're going to be paying money for them. Planetary Resources, that private space company planning to mine asteroids, has partnered with another private space company, Virgin Galactic. The two companies issued a joint press release announcing the Virgin Galactic will provide the launch vehicles to deliver planetary resources spacecraft into low Earth orbit. Although they have yet to develop the asteroid mining technology, planetary resources plans to begin by placing several space telescopes into orbit. These telescopes will be launched on Virgin Galactic's newly announced satellite launcher, the Launcher 1. Forbes.com explains that Launcher 1 is a two-stage launcher, which is carried into the upper atmosphere by Virgin's White Knight 2, after which it then completes its journey into space. Launcher 1 is reportedly capable of handling payloads of up to 500 pounds at a cost of less than $10 million. Getting closer. Getting closer. And I, you know, we're seeing a lot of this, and we'll see a lot more of these private space companies mm -hmm. partnering with each other because they all have their, their own individual strengths, areas they're focusing goals. on. Um, we see it with SpaceX. A lot of companies are partnering with SpaceX to provide that launch vehicle to get them mm -hmm. into space. And because this is just um, light launches, these, these small um, telescopes, it's perfect for Virgin Galactic. Yeah. And uh, Virgin Galactic just announced that they are going to be moving forward with their private space flights. Right, because uh, I think the first flight's got Branson, his daughter, yes, and Richard his Branson's son. Yes, Branson's going to be going with his son and his daughter into uh, during the first flight. Right. And that will happen in 2013 with and their then, announcing. Yeah, and then there, from there we'll get, what? how many did they say, 200 or 300 people already signed up? Yeah, more, than, two, like, more than 200 uh, people. And uh, I think after people see a few successful flights go off, then more will sign up. And comparatively speaking, it's it's a cheap ticket, but you know it's still 200 grand. It's better than the uh, what was it, 13 million of uh, that the orbit around the moon. Insane, <laughs> yes. Well, I'll, I'll be waiting until the tickets come down. I'm sure they will slowly after these flights start taking place. But it's interesting that might be uh, waiting a while. They're moving forward, <laughs> but yeah, we'll wait a while. A leading UK astrophysicist asserts that intelligent extraterrestrials might be discovered this century. While speaking at the Euroscience Open Forum conference in Dublin, Ireland, Jocelyn Bell Burnell announced. I do suspect we are going to get signs of life elsewhere, maybe even intelligent life, within the next century. The Daily Mail jokes that this is a scientific prediction that will get dollar signs pinging in Steven Spielberg's eyes. But Brunel, a professor and astrophysicist at the University of Oxford, proposes that governments, rather than Hollywood filmmakers, should prepare for contact. She poses some interesting questions for governments to consider, such as, how well prepared are we? Have we thought of how we will approach them? Should we put them in a zoo, eat them, send in GIs to bring them democracy? According to the Daily Mail, Burnell believes we are most likely to find alien life where we find rocky planets with carbon dioxide and ozone in the atmospheres. But as the Times of India points out, even if we do find signs of alien life, it is likely to take decades to talk to them from Earth through radio or lasers. Burnell commented on this point, stating, Nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, so you're probably talking of conversations that could take 50 to 100 years just to get one way. In conjunction with this story, the Daily Mail referenced a poll conducted by the Royal Society that determined 44% of Britons believe extraterrestrial life exists, and more than a third feel we should be actively searching and trying to make contact with extraterrestrials. I find this a little interesting. I mean, this is not the first time we ever hear, you know, somebody predicting when we're going to uh, encounter extraterrestrial life, but I find her questions rather odd within the context of her presentation. I agree 100%. We're seeing this more and more with scientists at major universities posing these interesting questions, you know, doing their, their own speculations based on whatever they're basing them on. But, you know, it starts off with this sort of interesting intellectual premise, but then goes off with these they throw the crazy in. crazy questions to, I don't know, make light of the situation. It's like posing it as serious science, but then having a joke at it too. It's, I don't know, it's disturbing it's a, a little bit. Yeah, it's a little bit of a disturbing trend. Yeah. And, you know, hopefully... And I wonder, I wonder why that is. I wonder if you know, they feel the need to do that because there is still the ridicule factor when talking, um, you know, in, in a scientific community about UFOs or extraterrestrial life. Um, scientists 
sometimes feel the need to poke fun at, at it themselves because they think they're going to be ridiculed for well, I think that's taking quite a serious approach to the subject. Quite possible, and, and we're seeing that all the time now. Um, Come on, scientists. I don't want to eat an alien. <laughs> well, we're no. both vegetarians anyway, so. Yeah, that's not happening. <laughs> But yeah, eating them, that's Well, that's and, then, and then I think they go into a little bit about, um, you know, the fact of how long it could take for signals to be reached and the fact of nothing can travel faster than light. Well, we're seeing some interesting changes in physics this year with the Higgs boson and going from there and maybe we'll find a change in that. Right, and I've seen some interesting responses to this story already and people pointing out that scientists really need to get back to science and you know opening their minds and considering that anything is possible. That's uh, we, great. We don't know, you know. Statement. I mean, <laughs> physics change all the time. What we know about the universe changes all the time. So again, being stuck by you know our own principles or what science currently uh, ascribes to, you know, everything changes. Keep an open mind. Good point. One of the world's top universities announced it will offer a course about extraterrestrial life. The Telegraph reports that the Edinburgh University is teaming up with the Coursera Scheme, a U.S.-run project backed by Stanford and Princeton universities, which encourages leading institutions from around the world to make high-caliber courses available to the world online. One of the courses being offered is titled Introduction to Astrobiology and the Search for Extraterrestrial Life. Renald Liesk, a spokesman for Edinburgh University, stated, something like extraterrestrial life comes out of a wide and deep base of knowledge and academic endeavor. The university has one of the world's leading schools of science and engineering, and Liesk ex explains that extraterrestrial life can be viewed, quote, as a more niche area within science and engineering. According to the Telegraph, this course will aim to answer questions such as, is there life on other planetary bodies? And how is it distributed throughout the universe? <laughs> Good luck answering those in the course of a semester. Oh, seriously. That's but I think, I think this question. is really cool that they're doing this. And now if only that these courses would be free online to everyone, that would be great. But These courses are free. They are. I believe so they are. So we could sign up for this class. Exactly. Well, I'm going well, that's to. something I will point out. I mean, these are you know, some of the, the leading universities in the world involved with this. But this is not anything really that new. I mean, the fact that it's going to be online and free is something new and, mm -hmm. and interesting. But... Again, it's talking about astrobiology, and astrobiology over the past several years has grown in popularity, and all of the major universities around the world now are developing their own astrobiology programs. And our home university here, Arizona State University, has been a leader in yeah. that. You know, Professor Paul Davies is one of the, leader, the leading astrobiologists. The Space and Exploration School is doing awesome things down here. Right. But I hate to break this to you, Jason, but it looks like we're going back to school. Uh, I think I can do that. School is awesome. Now it's time for us to talk with our guest today, Dean Hagelin. We're happy to be joined by Dean Hagelin today on the show. Dean, thanks so much for joining us. Hooray! Thanks, guys. <laughs> you be bet. Here. Well, our audience probably knows you best from X-Files, but you have uh, many hats you wear. You're a businessman, a comedian. You, you do a lot of things, man. And uh, most recently, you know, one of the cool things is you did a, a documentary called The Truth is Out There. And that was actually right. shown at the uh, 2012 International UFO Congress. So yes. I'd love to hear from your mouth kind of an overview of what this film is. Uh, yeah. Well, it's sort of a, a one year in 2009. Uh, cameraman, director, tour podcast co-host Phil Lairness. Uh, got a camera and we went around the world interviewing a lot of the people that I know uh, from my years on the X-Files. You know, I played a computer hacker, conspiracy theorist, and so uh, a lot of the producers and the writers hooked me up because I said I want to research my role, and they hooked me up with all these key guys in like Los Angeles, Dr. Roger Lear, Jordan Maxwell, all these guys, and then from that, that circle built to meeting Alex Jones and... Uh, you know, all of the big names. Yeah, do I have to list them? I'm not name dropping <laughs> here, but, uh, you know. Anyway, so we went back um, and we went and interviewed a lot of these guys and uh, asked them, you know, what is the truth? How do you know you found the truth? And how do you know you found the truth when that guy right next door says you're full of it? So, you know, that was sort of the basis of the question. And then the conversation went from there. And as we traveled, it went off on a sort of tensions into, you know, consciousness, comedy, the search for the truth, 
And the idea that I was doing comedy at the same time at a lot of the conventions was this idea that the search for the truth can be fun. It doesn't have to be all, you know, like so many conspiracy documentaries are dreary. And then the ones that are supposed to be comedic actually make fun of these guys doing this research. So we found this third line, which is both fun and respectful of the work that everyone's doing. Because there's a lot of criticism that happens a lot um, that people will say that people don't take the subject seriously enough. So on that line, do you think that comedy and serious research could coexist and can and do? Uh, I think it can. I mean, but it comes down because you start going into fields of um, not just unproven, but there's an un provability based on three-dimensional scientific the way science works now you know in 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 that experiment it's actually just sort of our dog chasing its tail as it were that when you start getting into consciousness and other world ideas and stuff like that your basic science structure breaks down so therefore there's this quote-unquote unprovability to it and when you have that then it's easy to make fun of it, you know. Mm -hmm. So when then comedians approach it who uh, not take the easy route, but are trained to make fun of that which they don't really know, then it becomes sort of demeaning and downputting. Mm -hmm. So the the trick is how to have comedy that's inclusive, still be fun and funny, and at the same time. Uh, hold those beliefs or non-beliefs, whatever the case may be, you know, in the same project. So it was, uh, we had a hundred hours of footage and it was up to Phil to edit it all. It took him a whole year. He nearly went mad. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, in, in making the film, you, you attended a lot of uh, sci-fi conferences and UFO conferences and you included yes. a, a lot of uh, great conversations with some really good researchers, Richard Dolan, you know, the great yes. UFO historian, and you have David mm -hmm. Sarita, and you even talked to Bob Dean, a lot of people in there who, uh, you know, people in the UFO community are familiar with. Yeah. And I'd love to hear from you in, in your process of making this film and in your time on, you know, Lone Gunman, X-Files, and, and just overall your, your career being exposed to this topic, is there a, a piece of evidence you've, you've uh, been approached with or a story you've heard that to you is good compelling evidence um, for the to show that uh, there are extraterrestrial UFOs uh, yeah let's see there's so much um, well David Sarita is great because uh, his background in science and stuff like that the times we've talked you know he he points out that mathematically there's like 11 to 12 more dimensions than what we are uh, experiencing, right? So mathematically, there's proof of alternate um, realities that could be where ghosts hang out or, you know, that the ability to travel through space doesn't require time. You know, the ta 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 space-time matrix can be altered through mathematical means. So he's been really good in, in when we have conversations over lunch and stuff like that. Um, about bringing that kind of compelling evidence uh, past the brain set of like, really three guys in a spaceship trail to 22 million light years and come here and shine a flashlight up our ass. Really, that's that doesn't seem practical. But he has that conversation. Uh, and then with Dr. Roger Lear, who uh, uh, removes alien implants, he's removed 21 of them now, and I've seen one of them. And uh, in terms of, you know, otherworldly evidence, it's not as compelling because it's just a thin piece of wire. But his story of, um, you know, the very first patient that he removed uh, an alien implant from was between her big toe and her middle toe. And he had done a lot of foot surgery. And when he uh, first touched it, she came out of anesthetic completely. And then it was wrapped in a cheesecloth type material that the body didn't reject. So there was no white blood cells attacking it or anything. And when he took a bone scalpel to try cut the cheesecloth, the scalpel broke. So it was like this incredibly hard material. So this, uh, seeing that material and that little thin wire sort of like uh, was pretty compelling in terms of um, 
otherworldly stuff, you know, non-terrestrial origin. Is it alien? You know, is it nefarious? These are then all the questions that start coming in, as Richard Dolan points out in the in the documentary, right? So, uh, what's the answer to that? Uh, yes, yes, I've seen some pretty <laughs> compelling evidence. That's great. And like I said, you, you, the film was shown uh, at our film festival earlier this year in February. Yeah. So what, what's next for the film? The website is truth-is-out-there.com. It trips off the tongue, right? Yeah, uh, yeah it's truth is out there with dashes in between them all. And uh, there we list exactly where the movie is going to be appearing next. And uh, I think our next appearance, we're working on one in Chicago and New York in September. And then um, uh, I don't have it all memorized because it's going to be a very busy fall this uh, mm-hmm. this fall. So, uh, but it's going to be showing in a lot of places. Great. Got the website. Well, speaking of, of busy, I, I know you got a lot of things going on, but uh, you're also working on a project related to something that came out of this film, aren't you? Uh, that's right. Lee McCloskey was uh, one of the artists, the philosophers. Uh, he was an actor in Dallas, and you've seen him on TV a lot. Uh, he, he has a, a room uh, that he's created where they have salons and, and uh, a lot of uh, great stuff goes on there. And it's called The Hieroglyphs of the Human Soul. And we're doing a, a documentary just on that uh, based on how many people uh, in the Q&As after the documentaries when we would show it have questions about him, wanted to know more about him, all of that sort of thing. So. We are uh, have a Kickstarter campaign uh, under the hieroglyphs of the human soul, and uh, there's a lot of great um, pledges. Why am I blacking out all the time? That's weird, isn't it? You're being visited. I don't know Sci-fi. what's going on there. <laughs> weird flashes. Uh, the NSA is blocking my signal again. Um, so yeah, we got a Kickstarter campaign, and we're going to shoot a, a documentary about uh, going into depth into that room and his philosophy behind that. Awesome, awesome. Well, yeah. we'll make sure to include the link so everyone can find out more about that project and, Excellent. and help uh, it, get it going as well. And I, for one, am looking forward to hopefully one day seeing your improv comedy. <laughs> yes. I uh, I do one-man improv where I bring audience members on stage and do uh, – uh, normally I do an X-Files episode, but lately I've been doing Star Trek episodes and oh. – just having people randomly shout out any episode they want to, because I'm I'm up on my NCIS and my uh, other shows, so I can improvise those as well. Wow! Awesome. You should come do that at our conference. That'd yeah. be great. What? Come on! Why am I not there right now? <laughs> we got to wait till February. <laughs> oh yeah, right. I'd be happy to. Awesome. That'd be awesome. We'll have to keep in touch on that. Okay. Excellent. All right, Dean, we're out of time, but thanks thanks so much for everything, man. We appreciate talking to you. Um, congratulations on the film. It's a good film, and Thank good you. luck with the additional yeah. projects. And you can find Thank out more so about you at deanhaglin.com as well. That's right. Awesome. All right, Dean, thanks, take Dean. care. Thanks. You too. Take care, guys. Yep. On this show, we like to highlight events we think you might be interested in, like these. The 2012 MUFON Symposium will take place the weekend of August 3rd through the 5th at the Northern Kentucky Convention Center in Covington, Kentucky. This year they pose the question, UFOs, friend or foe? Do we know what they are? And if they are not from here, then where are they from and why are they here? You can see the speaker list and find out more at 2012symposium.mufon.com. The Astronomical Society of the Pacific, in partnership with the American Geological Union National Optical Astronomy Observatory, presents Communicating Science and Education and Public Outreach Symposium, August 6th through the 8th at the Doubletree Tucson Reed Park in Tucson, Arizona. Find out more about this event at astrosociety.org slash events slash meeting. The San Diego Astronomy Association presents the Julian Starfest 2012, August 16th through the 19th at the Menhini Winery in Julian, California. The event features speakers, vendors, star viewing parties, and more. There is on-site camping for this event. Find out how to register and other information at julianstarfest.com. And don't forget the 2013 International UFO Congress, which is the largest annual UFO conference in the world, will take place this coming February. If you register before September 1st, you can take advantage of our special super early bird rates. Find out more at ufocongress.com. That's all for this episode of Spacing Out. Be sure to visit openminds.tv for all the latest news. And join us again next week when we'll have Erin Ryder on the show. You probably know Ryder from her TV shows, Destination Truth, and most recently, Chasing UFOs. And just so you know, 
The new episode of Chasing UFOs airing tonight is the episode when the team visits our home state of Arizona. And I got to join the team and participate in a Skywatch they did when they were here. So check out the show tonight on that Geo, and you just might see maybe, I don't know, maybe a couple seconds at the back of my head. I'm maybe your guessing. hand operating yeah, the telescope. Yeah, you see like a, a random hand on a telescope or something. It's probably my hands. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Remember to like this episode on YouTube and leave your comments. I'm Maureen Ellsbury. And I'm Jason McClellan. We will see you in the future.